Thank you, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you. Well, well, that was a... Uh, they just had to restart the computer. And, you know, this is one of those ways. Well, this is the book. Thank you so much, Ava, for publishing. Thank you so much, all of you. And my friends from the Club of Rome, uh, Andres and Johan, please. Hello, hello. Stand up. Stand up. Members of the Club of Rome. I'm a member of the Club of Rome. It's great to have them here. <laughs> you know, it, it, is, it is fantastic. I was here last uh, September um, at the Organics Conference. And, and, and please don't expect me to tell you how to be great. Um, that, that would be preposterous for me to pretend to do that. Uh, what I would like to do is, is kind of inspire you. And, and here is the title of one book called The Blue Economy, but then next to it I have my latest book in French, um, which is Soyons aussi intelligents que la nature. Let's be as intelligent as nature is. Um, you know, I've unfortunately, unfortunately, been called the Steve Jobs of sustainability. And, and you know, there's no way you can be a Steve Jobs. But, you know, the one who said it was the Huffington Post. You know the Huffington Post? And the Huffington Post said the day of the elections of the President of the United States that Trump had a 2% chance to get elected. So don't believe them. <laughs> don't believe them. I mean, they're wrong all the time. But my friends in Latin America call me the Che Guevara. Um, apparently, I'm quite disruptive in the way that I operate. Um, but I just want to show you I'm not Che Guevara. Look, that's where I live. This is my, this is my home. I want you to see that we're living... And, and the most beautiful thing I have in my home is my shoji, where I don't need anything on the wall. I just need to see the life of the shades of the plants into my rice paper window. And, and when I open it, I have the greatest luxury in life that anyone can have, is that my gardener... My, my home is 54 square meters. The garden is 153 square meters. But in that garden, I have a flower blossoming every day of the year. Hey to the gardener. I mean, hey, kudos to him. Because that is quite amazing how you do that. Now, my son loves tatami as well. I only show you one. It would take me long to take, show my whole family. I have six children. Um, but my dogs love tatami as well. So I just want you to know that living on tatami is my way of life. And, and, and this is how we think. This is when my youngest son was born. He's now four. If you want to know, my eldest is 32. Um, my youngest son was born, and when he was conceived, I thought I got to do something special. So I decided to go back to the traditional Chinese bamboo weaving technique. And I had this crib woven without any metal, without any glue. This is art. But then my wife, of course, Katerina, said, uh, look, Gunther, wonderful project. It's a bit hard for the baby. <laughs> and, and, you know, you, you, need a, you need your wife to tell you that, you know, great idea, but. So I got into my next creative mood, and I mobilized 3,000 silkworms. And these silkworms were working for six months, and after six months, the silkworms had made a nearly one centimeter thick carpet over the bamboo. You know, this is design. This is eco design. <laughs> you know, why, why silk? Because silk is the creation of nature where there is no fungus, no bacteria, no virus will thrive on there. That's why it is an amazing creation. That's why the baby has to sleep in a silk bed. And it's, of course, raw silk. Now, that has become an industry of its own. That's the way I like to think. I mean, do it for the baby is extravagant, but creating a new industry is an opportunity. We're now creating the lamps combining two great traditions, bamboo weaving and silk. And the silkworms do bring an extraordinary new dimension to it. You know, we, we have to surprise ourselves with what is possible. Today, I must say, we can't keep up demand. We don't have enough bamboo weavers. 
So the Chinese government is again setting up trainings for bamboo weavers so we can weave without glue and without metals. You know, this is what we need to do. And, and here we are in, in Patagonia. You know, I was asked by the Argentinian government, what are the future sectors for Argentina based on the incredible resources of Argentina? And here is Patagonia. What is the most diverse resource you see in this forest? What is it? Yeast. There are a thousand varieties of yeast per square kilometer. Do you know that 98% of all yeasts in bread, beer, and wine today are GMO? Do you realize that 80% of the yeast is dominated by three companies? It's insane. Fermentation is the basis of our food, healthy food. And we leave it up to what? GMO, and we didn't even know it? You know, this is what gets me mad, but this is what gets me going as well. And so we're starting in Argentina a program to have a thousand wild yeasts within the next decade for the world to enjoy. Enjoy quality beer. Why not? I'm Belgian. Quality beer, quality wine, quality bread. But we need to get the wild yeasts back. And I'm sure, Estonia, when you go into your forest, you never look at your yeasts in the forest. But it is what you should be looking for. Yeast is so easy to harvest. Get a little wet, uh, a little wet uh, handkerchief and just hold it in there, you know, and you put it in your pocket and next day you get yeast in your pocket. <laughs> I mean, yeasts are everywhere. I mean, we're organizing now yeast safaris. I mean, why do you want to go and look at elephants? I mean, go and catch some yeast instead. And, you know, yes, and I do work with those big guys as well. So we got the first proof of concept with Heineken, and they're using wild yeast, the mother yeast from Patagonia. You know, this is how we have to think. We have to get this on. But what does it mean? It means that's a billion-dollar industry. Why do we want to stay small? Why do we want to stay too insignificant? we got to change the statistics of the world. And that means we can't rely on just a small yeast project somewhere. We must bring it to scale at speed. And that's my, my challenge. So the underlying dynamics, though, is to stay positive. I mean, with Ingvar discussing yesterday over lunch, I mean, we have to get those emotions sometimes out of the way and just be positive about all the opportunities we're given all the time. But I wonder, who knows this guy? Who knows him? Anders Nuqvist. Who knows Anders? None? He's the creator of the first eco-village in Europe. <laughs> it's celebrating its 50th anniversary this year, Rum Pan. And it's fenced here. Yeah, how do you tell you on Rum Pan? I know Rum Pan is a st strange word for the Swedes. I, I accept that, but that calls for attention. It means. So what is happening is that we don't even know the people who've been pioneering this for so long. The Rumpen village, we've made 10 videos about it. I mean, it is one of the greatest examples around, and we don't know. So let's discover ourselves. Just like Ingrid is saying, let's discover ourselves. Well, let's discover the people around us as well. And this is the eco-school he created. I know we all like the magnificent eco-school of Bali. I've been teaching there. But we got incredible eco schools out here as well. This is in Lagerberg, outside of Sundsvall. It is working winter and summer, naturally. And I think this is important. You know, I, I came in this morning in this, in this tent and I was wondering, I mean, this is certainly not an example of eco design. <laughs> I mean, I'm so sorry, you know, I know you gotta solve issues, but this is not eco design. I mean, the air has to go out. Now, this. Sports Hall is designed by Anders Nuqvist, and the more people in there, the fresher it gets. Now, that is eco-design. Unfortunately, the more people in here, the hotter it gets. So, I was 1984, very privileged to be invited to Colombia, and we went to the Vichada. Who has been to the Vichada? No? One? Well, the Vichada is this area where nothing is happening. 
I mean, it was deforested by the Spaniards 300 years ago. You can imagine, 300 years ago. And in 84, Paolo Lugari said, I'm going to regenerate the forests. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we started tree by tree. Today, we have regenerated the forests. We have the largest biodiversity, regenerated biodiversity in Latin America. We brought back the 256 species of the Orinoco Valley by starting to plant tree by tree. But planting a tree is not enough. You have to have community. You have to have people who can live there, people with a revenue, people. So this is the only area in Colombia where there is full employment. Full employment. Why settle for less? Why accept this economic theory that you should have 3, 5, 6% unemployed, or in Europe, 25 or 50% youth unemployment? But once you have the trees grown, and I can't go into details in the workshop tomorrow, we'll go more into details if you like to. But once you change the temperature of the soil and you secure the growth of the biodiversity again, then you're producing water. 70% of the local population was suffering from gastrointestinal diseases. Today, zero. Why? Because we decided that drinking water should be for free. Drinking water is life. How could you ever commercialize that? That is insane. But we also have this hermit crab system with bicycles. You know the hermit crabs? You know, they, they, they borrow a, 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 little, a little shell from, a, from another uh, mollusk, and then they live in there, and then they're growing, and they need to get out of there and find another one. Well, we do the same with bicycles. As of six years old, every child in the community, that's a community of 10,000 people, every child receives the bicycle for free. What happens when you give the children a bicycle at the age of six and they drink three liters of water a day? What happens? Well, they get healthy. I mean, what a problem. Yeah, it was a major problem because we built a hospital and we had to close the hospital because we had a lack of patients. You know, development is not hospitals. Development is not needing hospitals. And of course, and everyone is a barefoot medical doctor. Everyone learns how to set the bone straight again. Everyone learns how to stitch a skin that has been ripped open by one or the other unfortunate circumstance. But we need to have this shift in thinking. And for me, anything that has worked that sounds like fantasy for people I translate into a fable, a children's story. You know, the greatest responsibility we have in life is to tell every day fascinating, inspiring stories to the kids. And these can't be stories where at the end it is, and they happy, then they had children, and they were... No, 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 no. None of that. We want to know that we need the children to take responsibility to do much better than we've ever done. And if we don't have that humility, we're not going far. I've worked a lot with construction design. This is our bamboo buildings. But what I think is very important is we need to think what are the needs for the farmers and how we can keep farmers on their farmland. And one of the key things that we're working on, ladies and gentlemen, is this, the toilet. I mean, you can't have an eco-village with a flushing toilet that mixes feces and urine. I'm sorry. Nature has been designed in such a way that liquids go that way, solids go that way. And why do we mix it with drinking water? I mean, could we ask ourselves who was in charge of this design of the toilet? Because it is quite obvious that if nature decided it should go in two ways, you shouldn't be mixing it. And the worst is we're exporting the stupidity all around the world. So in Cape Town, South Africa, 30% of the drinking water, and they say they don't have drinking water anymore, 30% of the drinking water is to flush toilets. Insane. So you come to my home, only dry toilets. 
Anyway, the air conditioning, that's another story. I will not go into detail about that. All houses must be natural ones. You know, I will go through it. But we need to bring pride back to the people. I mean, this is bamboo structure. This is the largest bamboo structure in modern history. It was done 19 years ago in Manizales, Colombia. By putting up that structure, we today have 7,000 new jobs. People who think that building with bamboo is, is what is to be done. You know, you have to inspire people and you have to do it and to show it works and it is beautiful. And so today, one of my big projects, my big new project, is I'm going to show the world that the design, this incredible dome design that has been so, so geniusly kind to developed over the years, has an inspiration in nature. You know what this building is? This is St. Peter's Basilicum in the Vatican. And did you know that this was designed by Michelangelo? And did you know that this is the first time the Fibonacci code was used in a large structure? You know the Fibonacci code? I hope you do. If not, let's talk about it afterwards. But the Fibonacci code was for the first time applied in this large scale because it offered a 35% saving in materials. I mean, material efficiency, 35% by applying the Fibonacci code. And this dome applies this. I mean, this incredible structure could never have been done without the Fibonacci code. And so what we have decided is that, yes, this inspiration comes from there. We can show where it is exactly how the mathematics works in the building. That's the genius of Michelangelo that no one has been explaining. So we're redoing this building, showing the compression strengths, the tensile strengths, the flexibilities based on the Fibonacci code in this dome at the World Expo 2020 in Dubai. It will be the first time that a Catholic church will be present in a Muslim country. And what do they show? The genius of Michelangelo using the mathematics of nature. I think that is a deep message we have to bring out. You know, we have to use what we have. We don't expect the Earth to produce more. We have to do much more what the Earth produces. And this was the little factory that I constructed in 1991. But I just want to point out it's not weekend, it's, sun it's Monday morning. Monday morning at 10 o'clock, no cars parked. It was not because we're on strike. There's no cars parked because I paid my staff half a euro per kilometer to ride the bicycle to work. You know what happens? You pay people half a euro per kilometer to ride the bicycle to work, they come on the bicycle. I mean, why make it complex? Why lobby with your congressman? Just do it. You know, and I think this is what we're missing very often is that this pragmatism in our approach on how to change things. So let me share with you some of my big fights at the moment, fights that we enjoy. And this is the fight against shale gas. Who likes shale gas? Fracking. Anyone here in favor of fracking? Okay. See, that's why they call me the Che Guevara, the other ones. So what we're doing is based on the scientific research. We have now in five different countries the project to farm seaweeds. We farm a thousand tons of seaweeds per hectare, 25 meters deep. This is what we call 3D farming. And by having a thousand tons, now I'm taking this example because Estonia used to be a large supplier of seaweeds. I mean, you were the supplier of seaweeds from the Baltics and today you just let it rot there. I, I mean, I don't get it. Why? Why are you doing that? Why don't you use it? Let me tell you what we're doing. We're taking the seaweeds, and it's a bit, 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 big mass. Huh? Seaweeds grow fast, and they're easy. But what is nice is that we're able to ferment the seaweed into natural gas. If you don't want to buy gas from Russia, I agree. But then make your own gas from your seaweed. We're producing eight hundred five. Sorry. Per hectare, we're producing 585 cubic meters of natural gas per day by having 1,000 tons of seaweeds per year. This means we can actually produce gas at a third of the price of shale gas. 
This is what we have to do. We have to outcompete these guys. We don't have to be against them. We have to do much better than they could ever do. And Belgium is the first country that has in its national plan for the development of the maritime space that they have, they have reserved 400 square kilometers for farming seaweeds. Estonia, where are you? Where are you? I mean, we only have 3,300 square kilometers of, la of maritime space. You have more. Go for it. Don't wait. Tomatoes. You know, one of the things that I was always impressed with when I go to these conferences about farming and agriculture is that everyone wants water. I'm sorry, who said farming needs water? Who said we have to put the plants on this water addiction? We've turned it around, and here you have an example, developed in Australia, but developed by an Englishman, Charlie Patton. And Charlie developed a technique whereby we're taking the colder 10, 20 meter deep water, we pump it through the soil, we get the water back to the sea, and we are reducing the dew points. The result is, ladies and gentlemen, that we did this test in 2009, and this is how it looks like in 2017. We're producing 17,000 tons of tomatoes, and for every kg of tomatoes, we're producing, producing three liters of water. We gotta change the logic. Don't accept what the scientists tell you. <laughs> Eco design means you use everything you have, and you use cold water, coldness. You can produce a lower uh, dew point. You can generate water. It means we turn the logic around, and this is what we need. And let me talk about pigs, if you permit me. I love pigs. Pigs are smart, but pigs love to live together with chickens. Did you know? I mean, when pigs are with chickens, both are happy. Why? Because the chicken does not permit any insect to stay on the pig. There's an insect or a parasite getting close to the pig, Pack! the chicken eats it. For the pigs, this is like daily massage. You know, I mean, <laughs> continuously being taken care of by these chickens. Now, these chickens, they do something else in return. The, the pig does something else in return. This is the farm, actually, Schweizfurt, you know, who knows Hermannsdorf, a Landwerkstätte in Germany? Please, I mean, Georg, my dear Georg Schweizfurt, uh, who's uh, taking over from his dad, I mean, wonderful work. But what they did not know, and this is why sometimes it's nice to have someone visiting, when they have these little homes, you know on the bottom sleeps the pig, and on the top sleeps the chicken. Great, but this only works very well if the pig goes to the toilet before sleeping. Now, everyone thought that this was a joke, but today, actually, we have developed a technique worldwide where we teach the pigs to go to the toilet after eating. And it takes three days. I don't know how long it took you to be clean, but I mean, I think it took a little bit more than three days. Uh, and so the pigs need only three days to be clean because they're smarter than dogs. Now, you know what it means in your cost price of keeping pigs when you don't have to clean up after them? It will take me too long to explain that in plenary session, but those interested in teaching pigs how to be clean, come and talk to me. <laughs> but one of the key things is that we're making this fundamental error of comparing pork per kilo with another pork per kilo. I mean, why are we comparing nutrition? Why are we comparing kilos and not nutrition? Ladies and gentlemen, the Schweizfurt pigs, which we have analyzed, have more omega-3 than salmon does from Norway. More omega-3. Because they permit the pig to live on for more than a year. And then the pigs naturally develop omega-3. Now the key is, can you get the price of salmon for your pork? And that has happened now. Because we're not selling per kg we're selling for nutrition. And this will change the whole way we're looking at ecological design. Ladies and gentlemen, let's conclude with my largest initiative. This is an initiative where we're helping the petrochemical industry to exit. We don't have to tell them that they're bad, they know they're bad. We don't have to tell them they're polluting, they know they're polluting. 
you have to help them get out of the business. And so here is this extraordinary plant called the thistle. You know thistles? Cardoon, cardo, you know, chardon en français. The thistles are amazing things. Now, ladies and gentlemen, in Porto Torres, Sardinia, we're extracting from the thistles all the ingredients to make plastics, to make lubricants, to make softness for plastics, and the substitute for glyphosates. We're the first producers of substitutes for glyphosates, and we extract it from a thistle. This is the thistle's revenge. <laughs> yeah, they have to take some of Ingvar's courses on their emotional controls. Uh, but they're taking their revenge now. We are cheaper. Now, what is important in this whole equation is that when you have a thistle and you harvest a thistle, then there are these white little spots on the thistle flower. An old lady came to us and said, could I have some of that dust? And we didn't even know it was there. These are bacterial enzymes they need to make cochise. We didn't know in our production that we have 2,000 tons of bacterial enzymes to make goat cheese. That's enough bacterial enzymes to make goat cheese in the whole of Italy. But we thought we were substituting chemicals. And I think this is very important. We're putting products in the market that respond to real need. But this is the facility we took over. This is the old petrochemical facility which is converted into the largest biorefinery in Europe. Petrochemistry out, thistles in. That is the way we need to think. Positive, concrete. Ladies and gentlemen, 835 million euro has been invested. Capital follows. The money market is ready to follow this. And we only work with what we call legacy investors. Investors who take 25-year point of view, who don't want an exit in, within 25 years. It's capital gains only over the long term. You know, what we need to do is to rethink everything. And that is why eco-design is so critical. We started in Germany with diapers. And this is how it looks like in advertising, but this is how it looks like after use. <laughs> and unfortunately, what do we do with it? We throw it away. We throw it away. So we've started the redesign of diapers. Six years ago, we initiated it. And now we're having the diapers with the bioplastics from the thistles, we're mixing it with the a, with a cellulose from bamboo, which is the waste of the bamboo. And of course, we add charcoal to it. You can't do it without biochar. I mean, otherwise, the poor bum of the baby will be red, and then it doesn't sleep. So we are adding charcoal for the skin protection. And all of that is turned, at the end, into terra preta. We want to become leading producers of terra preta. Diapers is terra preta. A baby produces a thousand kilograms of this material a year. <laughs> One kilogram of terra preta is enough to feed the nutrients necessary for a fruit tree to come. That means one baby is a thousand fruit trees. One fruit tree after 10 years gives me 50 kilograms of fruits. That means one baby is 50 tons of fruits. <laughs> That's how we have to think. You know, it's not fair we're missing these opportunities. So if there is any wish in Estonia, become the first terra preta um, diaper country of the world. <laughs> that is the kind of stories we have to tell. Ladies and gentlemen, I can go on for many hours and I have already taken too much time. But what I think is important is I come back to what I said earlier. We need to tell the inspiring stories to the children. Whatever you and I think all the time is fantasy, for the children it is reality. Children don't differentiate between fantasy and reality. Everything is reality. And we have to keep, we have to give our children the chance to keep on dreaming for the rest of their lives. Because the moment they stop dreaming, our society has no future. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.
thank you, Günther. Thank you. Thanks a lot. <coughs> um, my name is Oit, and I'm going to moderate the next 10 minutes. It was supposed to be 20, but now it's 10 left. But it's going to be sustainable from that perspective then. Um, I know Günther, Günther for many years, but I don't remember from where I know him. I've read his book about 10 years back, and I heard your speech about 10 years back from somewhere, but I still don't remember where it was. But it was in English. Um, I was asked to ask some questions from you, and, and I was thinking where to start, and, and I'm starting from my, myself. I mean, I'm an economist, I'm an entrepreneur and sport activist by my background. Um, and my question is, am I sustainable? And where can I book, buy a book how to become a sustainable? I'm, a, I'm wearing a Red House t-shirt, which is claimed to be sustainably made. Uh, guest jeans, Echo uh, boots from Denmark, sustainable country. Uh, Carmen Wedge from US. I have uh, three daughters, five bicycles, and one multi-van uh, sort of um, camper one uh, for driving. Am I sustainable? I'm training 10 hours a, a day, a week, sorry. Am I sustainable? Absolutely not. <laughs> Tell me about your toilet. <laughs> you gotta start with the toilet. What are you doing with your pee and your poo? You know, yesterday I was in my country house and I went three times to the toilet, but not to the toilet, but behind the tree. Okay. So, was it sustainable? Well, that depends. That depends. <laughs> I mean, I don't know if you're having any antibiotics or so, but I mean, uh, at any rate, what, what I think is very important, we have to, I think, for sustainability, have a check. What, do you ha what happened to your shower water? What happened to it? What happened to your toilet? What happened to your food waste? I mean, you've got to start with what you ingest and what you excrete. And that's where sustainability and eco-design starts, not with what you wear. That's too late already. I mean, okay. I'm sorry. You know, this, I mean, after the petroleum industry, the textile industry is the most polluting in the world. I mean, textile is a disaster. So even if they tell me it's echo, it's not. I mean, it's echo for the greenwashers. But we don't like greenwashing, do you? But how many pairs of jeans can you use annually? How many uh, pairs of jeans you are using annually? Oh, no, 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 no. I, I'm confessing that I'm not sustainable in my clothing. <laughs> I don't. But, but whenever I can, at home, we take care of the water, we take care of the food, we take, you know. So, so we, have, we have to start where we are. And I think it's very important that we keep it simple. You know, just like we have to look in, inside, we have to look at what goes inside and what comes out again. But is sustainable more about the planet or about ourselves? No, 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 no. If, you are, if you're not sustainable, the planet can never be sustainable. I mean, the only way to be sustainable is to start with yourself. I mean, the reason I'm asking it is that, for example, um, even if our children are, children are somehow sustainable, um, only 15% of them are moving enough to be, to, become, to be alive. Only 15% of children are moving one hour a day. So meaning that 85% of children are not moving yeah, one hour a day. Yeah, because the parents are not moving either. Yeah, but that's what I'm asking. Is sustainable only about the planet or is it about myself, my habits, my It starts with health? you. It starts with you. And if you can't take care of the health of yourself and you can't take the sustainability of yourself, then it's impossible. So I would suggest you don't wear a watch, you know, instead of having a watch don't have a watch. Um, one of our priorities in our family is we eliminate batteries. We're obsessed with batteries. No batteries. I mean, this is the addiction of our world. If you tolerate batteries in your house, you're tolerating mining. The mining industry is the worst in the world, after textiles and petroleum. <laughs> Sometimes ex -equo. You know, but what we need to do is we need to take the reasons of the injustice in societies out of our home. And that starts, for me, with a battery. I mean, just think how many batteries you're using in your home. Just start thinking how many of these batteries are supposedly recyclable. Ha, ha, ha. You know, we're not. And so this is where we start the challenge. And from my home and my children, all six know that whatever we do, we should not have a battery. And if there is a battery, then it should always be a battery that we double check. Can we charge and recharge 5,000 times? And most of the batteries, you can't. 
But Günther, make it very clear. Ten years back when I heard your speech, you were telling that you know, green is not sustainable and blue economy is sustainable. No, 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 we're, no, we're trying but, to be sustainable. Yeah, yeah, but, but, but I mean, uh, but, uh, people should pay more for green food. No, it's should more never cost- pay more. Uh, no, no, but, but your spe- in your speech, ten years back, you said that green is not sustainable and blue is sustainable. Because um, from a blue value chain, you get more out than just you know, the output. It was just your words that, that green is not okay. sustainable from may, a perspective. May I disagree with myself? Okay. <laughs> may I show that over the years I've learned something new? You know, I mean, this is, of course, one of the big challenges with green is that when you have a society where you are requested to pay more for what is good for you and good for the environment, you have created society of the rich. So the rich, the filthy rich can be green and the other ones can't. So that is not the society we want. But that is linked to the business models we have created, because we want everyone to be this economy of scale, this uh, standardized, the volume, focused and always cheaper. And that is how we suck, actually, the value out of society. And that's how we externalize all the costs. Um, blue economy is not sustainable today. I hope that we will be, in one, two generations, truly sustainable. But the first thing is we have to have a few basic principles about what is life. And life is air, so we need to take dust out of the air, with mining in particular. And second, we need to have drinking water as sacred. Drinking water is sacred. That's why you can't pee in it. Um, let's, thanks. Let's talk some words about Estonia. I know that there is going to be some sort of talk after that about the sustainability of Estonia. Estonia is generally a green country. Roughly half of that is covered by forest, and the other is not. Only we have this uh, uh, ele- electricity plant in Narva, which is not sustainable, which is kind of uh, burning oil shale. But if we exclude this, Estonia is quite green country. But uh, we have a paradox in Estonia. Uh, even though we are 50% green, we are exporting our logs. Yes, log houses as well, but mostly logs. Like, um, and we're exporting this to Scandinavia, and they are producing cellulose and paper and etc. cetera. And, uh, but exporting logs is just like exporting crude oil from Nigeria. I mean, economy won't get rich exporting pure uh, natural resources. But now, at the same time, knowing this, um, society is kind of against building a sort of a, um, cellulose plant, plant to Estonia. So how you would solve that issue? First of all, we shouldn't be using cellulose from trees to make paper, first. That's, uh, that, that's insane. That, is, that was the solution 2,000 years ago. Today, I mean, we have launched worldwide the use of uh, dust from mines, the mineral dust, as the base material for paper. So I think cellulose should be used for chemistry, for renewable chemistry. Cellulose should never be used for paper. I mean, one sheet of paper, one sheet of paper consumes still between 8 and 14 liters of drinking water. Doesn't make sense. Shouldn't do that. We should make paper without water, as we are doing today. And so cellulose should not remain in the old business model and saying, oh, we shouldn't export the logs so they make cellulose elsewhere. Don't log for that purpose anymore. I mean, harvest your yeasts in your forests and you will make more money. And you drink better beer. (laughs) Okay, I have the last question. I mean, actually I have two questions, but anyway, you can answer fast. First, are green politicians useful or useless? Depends on the individual. I mean, there are great people on the right, and there are great people on the left, and there are great green people. It depends on the individual. So I wouldn't stereotype it. Please never do. Okay, and then the final question would be, uh, you were saying about the inspiring stories. If there would be an inspiring story about blue Estonia, how would it start and how would it end? Well, it would start by admiring what you have and you didn't know. So I would start about the wonderful yeast in your forests. And I would end up with a great beer. <laughs> okay, thanks a lot. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.